Okay. Well, good evening and uh, uh, officially welcome. My name is Samir Gandesha, and as I mentioned, I'm uh, the director of the Institute for the Humanities. Um, I'm really hoping to be able to make a little bit of sense when I uh, uh, say a few words uh, by way of introduction. Uh, if I don't, it's because uh, I'm massively jet-lagged. I just got back from China uh, literally a few hours ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm really feeling the 15 hours time difference. I'm, I'm in a sense uh, inhabiting the, the future and the present simultaneously. So it, it should be fun. Um, so uh, before I, I go on, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge that this event is taking place on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. Um, and um, uh, the background for the talk is the Institute's interest, um, uh, so the Institute for the Humanities' interest, in the fate of the university in neoliberal times. Uh, by no neoliberal times, I mean the period from roughly um, the late 1970s um, to the present. So in the late 1970s, public institutions and public goods were increasingly privatized. As a result, the university has had to contend with shrinking budgets and has, and has had to make up uh, for such a shortfall by either raising tuition fees um, or uh, looking increasingly to the private sector um, for its funding. Both options combined has made the university particularly sensitive to pressure brought to bear on academic freedom, uh, both because I think students are increasingly encouraged to think of themselves as consumers of educational products or commodities, um, rather than uh, often challenging, um, think of education uh, as, as a kind of product rather than a kind of uh, uh, challenging and sometimes risky life-changing experience and because corporations are ever more empowered to invite universities to serve their needs uh, as education factories and demand that insofar as they pay the piper they get to call the tune. For example, the director of the University of Toronto's prestigious Monk School for Global Affairs, while appointed by the university, reports to a board appointed by Peter Monk himself, who is a chairman and founder of Barrick Gold. The Institute for the Humanities has itself faced pressures on its own um, uh, uh, for um, uh, academic freedom. Or it's faced pressures uh, of, of, on its own academic freedom. For example, it was pressured not to support a photographic installation that documented some parallels, some historic parallels, between settler colonialism in Canada, South Africa, and Israel because of the fact that it supposedly created an unsafe space for Jewish students. It has also been criticized for sponsoring the screening of a film and ensuing panel discussion about the operations of a Canadian mining company El Dorado Gold uh, in Greece um, uh, with threats to make representations at the Board of Governors. It has been maligned as well by members of Ezra Levant's rebel media and so on. However, to its credit, the university administration has stood by us rather steadfastly. So it would seem that the university is also threatened not by the reigning consumerism and, cons and corporate culture um, uh, from without, um, but also seems to be threatened by elements of those claiming to be on the left in its attempt to create a learning environment that is as unthreatening as possible. Teaching in, the, uh, teaching in Ontario in, in the mid-1980s, I recall the discussion of a proposed policy governing universities that would enforce zero tolerance for offensive speech in the classroom. From the standpoint of someone who teaches political theory, this uh, was a non-starter. To teach real-world examples about politics, the Israeli-Palestine uh, conflict, the troubles in the north of Ireland, American foreign policy, etc., was to offend someone somewhere. The point was, of course, to engage in these discussions in a balanced, reasoned, uh, evidence-based, and dispassionate way. In the classroom, that is. Zero tolerance policies of any kind leave little room for any kind of nuance. Today it seems that universities have doubled down on the creation of non-offensive speech, a speech that will uh, upset exactly no one. Perhaps n now um, more in the, in the US than in Canada, however, as with everything else, it is just a matter of time before the rest of the globe follows suit. So apparently students require trigger warnings, um, now not before viewing a graphically violent film, uh, for example, which as in the news media is not unreasonable, but before reading a text by Ovid or Chinoa Achebe, 
Recently, a mother of a high school student in, I believe it was Tennessee, informed his English teacher that he would not be reading To Kill a Mockingbird because of the offensive and demeaning language used by the author. Such attempts to shield the sensitive inevitably leads to a sanitization of history, as in the case I mentioned above, to protect Jewish students from the creation of putatively unsafe spaces. In recent days, the Twitter sphere has been rife with discussion of an open letter to the journal, the feminist philosophy journal, uh, Hypathia, demanding that an article that argues that the logic supporting transgenderism also supports transracialism, rather than arguing that, that space ought to be provided for trans women and women of color. Uh, feminists whose work was not engaged in the article, the open letter demanded a retraction of the article on the grounds that the argument constituted harm to trans people. It is against this background, a background of what I would call uh, victim culture, that I think Laura Kipnis's book is so important. One may not agree with all of what she writes, um, uh, to say that it is a necessary and rare contribution to a long overdue conversation in the academy and perhaps also beyond it. Kipnis's position has uh, no doubt been controversial. An initial discussion of campus sexual paranoia drummed up um, uh, a Title IX case against, which she, uh, um, against her, which she discusses in a chapter in her book. Indeed, like Ann Coulter, Milo Yiannopoulos, Charles Murray, um, uh, she has recently been the target of attempt, attempts to prevent her from speaking at, um, at university campuses, and namely Wellesley University, by a, co a coalition of faculty and students, in a manner that uncannily supports her own argument that universities increasingly infantilize their students, their female students in particular, and a result set back the cause of feminism by generations, a letter written by some uh, Wellesley uh, faculty member, members claims, we are especially concerned with the impact of speakers' presentations on Wellesley students who often feel the injury most, most acu acutely and invest time and energy in rebutting speakers' arguments. End quote. Many of us, perhaps mistakenly, are of the opinion that it is of the essence of a university education um, to make and rebut arguments. Unlike the former two speakers who are simply sensationalists uh, with little of substance to actually say, I mean, Milo is basically a performance artist, I think. Um, and Charles Murray, whose views on the correlation between IQ and race have been thoroughly discredited, Kipnis's arguments are worth taking very seriously. And also, of course, disagreeing with in a reasonable manner. Um, and one can see why people might want to. In this country, and in this province especially, we have endured uh, um, the spectacle of Robert Picton, who has systematically ass assaulted and murdered 49 women, most of whom were particularly vulnerable Aboriginal women. We've seen Jean Gomeshi walk free after what seemed to, very, seemed to be very strong evidence that he, vi he assaulted um, several women. We've heard from federal court judge Robin Camp, who asked a woman in a rape case why she didn't simply keep her knees together. Moreover, we've recently witnessed the case of former head of creative writing um, uh, at UBC, Stephen Galloway, whose employment was terminated over sexual misconduct, the, the details of which we'll never know given the confidentiality agreement uh, between him and the university. As people know, this case has created massive divisions within the Kant lit establishment. Of course, the United States has also just elected a president who bragged of grabbing women by the, you know what. <laughs> Uh, it's gratuitous. I mean, people, people know. People know, don't they? So there's been, a, there's been particular co controversy within the discipline of philosophy insofar as um, two of the cases Kip Kipnis discusses, uh, Ludlow and it's Garnet, right? Um, Barnett. Gar Barnett. 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 That's right. Barnett are, are philosophers. And philosophy, as my colleague Lisa Shapiro reminds me, has had many problems with which to can contend of late, such as allegations of predatory sexual behavior brought to bear against John Searle and Thomas Poga, and allegations of serious um, sexual harassment against Colin McGuinn. This is against the backdrop of a discipline that is extremely male dominated, with around 20 to 25 percent of tenure track faculty comprised of women. Nevertheless, we at the Institute feel that controversy and impassioned debate and argument is something that the university must do better to promote. I expect that we'll have lots to discuss in a reasonable and measured way in the question period that follows the talk. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Kipnis. 
Professor Laura Kipnis's latest book, Unwanted Advances, Sexual Paranoia Comes uh, to Campus, which you can purchase outside for how much? Do you... Oh, I don't know what it's selling for, okay. but I'll sign it. She'll sign it. <laughs> Value um, added. There's a, a book table out, uh, uh, outside there. Um, so this book arises from her experience uh, becoming the subject of a campus protest march and then a Title IX investigation for writing an essay and her own subsequent investigation into the convoluted factors that led to this turn of events. When not battling paranoia and would-be censors, uh, Kipnis is a cultural critic and former video artist whose work focuses on sexual politics, aesthetics, emotion, acting out bad behavior, and various other um, crevices of the American psyche. Her previous books, um, which include Men, Notes from an Ongoing Investigation, How to Begum Become a Scandal, and Against Love, a polemic have been translated into 15 languages. The essay that, uh, that started all the trouble, sexual, sexual Paranoia Strikes Academy, was included in the Best American Essays of 2016, uh, edited by Jonathan Franzen, who praised its professional risk-taking. Kipnis is a professor in the Department of Radio, TV, Film at Northwestern University, where she teaches uh, filmmaking. Um, the title of her talk, uh, as you all know, but I'll repeat it, uh, Sexual Paranoia Comes to Campus, Intellectual Freedom Takes a Curtain Call. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Laura Kipnis. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you for staying, too, as I was coming here in the taxi very, very slowly. I imagine people filing out one by one. So thank you for hanging around. Thank you to Samir for inviting me. Um, so here goes. Um, and I'm going to try to maybe inject a little levity into these <laughs> matters. Um, but let me tell you, Samir, I went into it a, a bit, but let me tell you a bit more of the backstory of how I ended up here today, uh, since it's kind of a weird story, at least to me. A few years ago, I was feeling kind of blocked as a writer uh, because there are, are all sorts of censorship, uh, including self-censorship. And I went to see a shrink to talk about how to get unblocked. Uh, and I found myself talking about how much I envy certain writers like Philip Roth, who seem to feel a lot of freedom on the page. And I remember talking in particular about this scene at the beginning of Sabbath Theater where Mickey Sabbath is masturbating on his wife's grave, which on the one hand is completely disgusting, and on the other, I wished I felt the liberty to write a scene like that, even though I'm not actually a novelist, I'm mostly an essayist. Anyway, in the midst of this moaning and blockage, I got an email from the editor, uh, an editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education, asking me to write an essay on campus sexual politics. And I'm someone who spent most of my career writing on sexual politics, and I suppose I have a reputation as something of a contrarian feminist. At first, I said no to the offer because I didn't think I had much to say on the subject, and because I thought of the Chronicle as sort of stayed and the last thing I wanted was to be hemmed in stylistically, which would hardly help the writer's block. But the editor persisted, and they said they wanted a no-holds-barred essay, and she kept flattering me about how great it would be and upping the money. Uh, and I'd previously sort of agreed with the shrink that I would write an article a month to get over the writer's block thing, so I said, okay. Uh, so this, you know, it was a bit of a casual uh, lead-up. And because I was under the impression that no one actually read the Chronicle <laughs> of Higher Education, I certainly never thought students read it. Um, maybe I felt a tang of the elusive freedom I was after. And so I wrote in a candid and somewhat ironic, maybe Rothian uh, way, Professor of Desire, uh, about the new campus codes banning professor-student dating and about trigger warnings and the increasing professions of vulnerability by students, women students mostly, and how from my vantage as a feminist, this was all pretty terrible for feminism. In my view, polic policies and codes that bolster traditional femininity, which has always favored stories about female endangerment over female agency, are the last thing in the world that's going to reduce sexual assault which is a goal I assume everyone shares, me included. The next thing I knew, students were staging a protest march against me in the essay. They were carrying mattresses and pillows in homage, I guess, to the mattress girl at Columbia. So they were marching to the president's office with their mattresses and pillows and signs accusing me of supporting rape culture. 
I think they were demanding that I be officially censured, but I never found out for sure. I was never notified in any official way by anyone on campus, and I happened to be in New York at the time, and I actually heard about it from a journalist who I was meeting for coffee who had Googled me, who said, you know, they're marching on you at cam on your campus. Uh, and that was the first I'd heard of it. Um, so all this was quite strange, and even more so when the story started getting national coverage. Though, as I later wrote, I quickly realized that all my writer friends were jealous that I'd gotten marched on and they hadn't. You know, it makes you feel a bit relevant if you're being marched on. And I noticed myself shamelessly dropping it into conversation whenever possible. <laughs> oh, students are marching against this thing I wrote. I'd grimace in response to anyone's, how are you? <laughs> This was in the second essay I wrote for the Chronicle after being brought up on Title IX complaints by two graduate students in philosophy, it should say, over, I should say, over the first essay, given the recent contretemps uh, about philosophy. I have a line in the book where I say that the more philosophers I talked to, the more I became convinced the field was populated by psychological nincompoops. <laughs> I hope there are no philosophers here. And after the recent uh, essay, the trans essay, I thought I should say just all round nincompoops. <laughs> anyway, the stu these students objected to me mentioning the case of a philosophy professor, Peter Ludlow, on our campus who'd been, been accused of sexual misconduct, though I'd actually only written uh, a few paragraphs in this first essay. One of their charges was that I created a hostile environment, or maybe it was a chilling effect. I wasn't entirely sure which, because I never actually got these charges in writing which led me to become interested in questions I'd never thought much about, like due process, which you know, is part of our constitution. I'm not sure if it is part of yours. Uh, and of course, academic freedom, which I think we do share uh, that norm. And free speech, uh, though it turns out you don't actually have free speech in the United States at a private university. So th these were many, the, some of the things that I learned in this process. Um, so between the protest march and the Title IX complaints, I started feeling like a detective who's gotten too close to the information so someone doesn't want him to have and gets thwacked on the head in a dark alley. It was like I was being warned off the subject, which obviously convinced me I was onto something and to keep writing more, if only out of stubbornness and refusal to be kowtowed. In my own case, getting hauled through the Title IX process, and I'll talk a bit more about that because I know you are not going to be as familiar with it. Um, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world for me because uh, I have tenure at a research university that is job security, at least nominally. I mean, it doesn't count for as much as it used to because actually people are getting canned left and right in these processes, but you know, I didn't know that at the time. The situation would be a lot different at a different sort of school or if I were on, was on a renewable contract. And in the US, I know that about half of uh, professors are now not on tenure track lines. You know, they are on renewable contracts. And in that case, if I were in that situation, I'd likely be out of a job and wondering how to pay my mortgage, a problem I suspect my student protesters haven't yet had to face. It's a sort of fear that shuts a lot of people up. So yes, I have privilege, that current version of original sin, though I'm using it to say things that others would probably be wiser not to say if they want to hold on to their livelihoods and dwellings. I know a lot about these risks now because I broke confidentiality by writing about my case in this second Chronicle essay, which was titled My Title IX Inquisition. And these are paywalled uh, by the Chronicle, but actually on my website, which is laurakipnis.com, there are PDFs of um, those two essays up if you want to read them. But once I went public, um, it put me on the receiving end of dozens of letters, I mean, probably hundreds by this point, letters and documents relating to other people's Title IX cases, both professors and students. My inbox became a clearinghouse for depressing and infuriating tales of overblown charges, secret tribunals, capricious verdicts, and frightening bureaucratic excess. A lot of what I learned was shocking, and I'm not exactly unjaded about institutional power. This story about the excesses and overreach of Title IX, and I know that you don't have the equivalent, but I, I mean, or you 
probably do have the equivalent, but just you know, under some other acronyms, I suspect. The extent of this, these secret tribunals, isn't much known because it all happens behind closed doors and because it's all shrouded in demands for confidentiality, gag orders effectively, enforced with threats in, about more charges if respondents go public. I myself risked more charges by writing about my case. I could have been charged with retaliation. And in fact, I actually was originally charged with retaliation. That was one of the charges that writing about these cases of this professor's alleged sexual misconduct was retaliatory against the students who had filed the complaints. So as you can tell, what I've learned makes me not the greatest fan of Title IX, at least in its current iteration. So for those of you who don't know the backstory, in 2011, the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights in the US expanded Title IX's mandate beyond gender discrimination. So this had been a federal statute that was supposed to ensure like equality in women's sports and things like that. So when I got this letter from the Title IX officer, I was like, what? Because you know, my only knowledge of Title IX was that it had something to do with women's sports. Uh, in you know, equal funding. So it was expanded in 2011 to incorporate sexual misconduct, but in the vastest, broadest sense. Everything from sexual harassment to coercion to rape. And uh, these guidelines were issued in this very vague manner in the form of what were called dear colleague letters. Note, I say, say in the book, note the the over the threatening tones of over or the faux cordial threatening tones of over empowered civil servants everywhere, <laughs> uh, and also the demand in these letters um, and these have the force these carry force uh, because schools in the U.S. that get federal funding that don't comply with these Title IX letters can have their federal funding yanked. So that's the sort of hammer that's used to ensure compliance. And part of the demand in these letters is that campus uh, procedures to adjudicate sexual misconduct use the lowest standard of proof possible, what's called preponderance of evidence, which is like I've heard it described as 50-50 plus a feather, as opposed to a standard like clear and convincing, you know, which is a, a higher standard of proof. How that feather of preponderance is arrived at on campus in these secret tribunals is, in too many cases, as I've learned, via crude gender stereotypes about men as eternal predators and women as virtuous victims, and complete guesswork, with Title IX officers surmising about what transpired in murky, generally alcohol-fueled sexual situations between undergraduates. I'm in no way disputing that sexual assault is a reality. But I do think we need more open discussion about the criminalization of sex currently underway and the unpreparedness of campus officials to adequately deal with the spectrum of gray areas that they're being asked to pronounce on. I know just how unprepared they are because I have spent the last year, before the book came out, reading various confidential Title IX reports people sent me along with court documents because more and more of these cases are hitting the civil courts in the US, uh, turning into civil suits, usually by male students who think they've been railroaded by the process. For example, being held responsible for drunken sex when both people in a heterosexual situation are equally drunk. But it's tough to raise such qualms on campus. The reason, I think, is that the culture of sexual paranoia I'd originally written about is a newfound theology on campus, and one not confined to the sexual sphere. It's fundamentally altering the intellectual climate in higher education across the board to the point that ideas that challenge conventional wisdom, such as those in my first chronicle essay, as Samir pointed out, are construed as threats. And consequently, freedoms most of us used to take for granted, the freedom to write a controversial essay, let's say, or be a controversialist, are being whittled away or disappearing altogether. It's worth pointing out that paranoia is a formula for intellectual rigidity, and its inroads on campus are effectively dumbing down the place to the extent that the traditional ideal of the university, 
as a setting for the free exchange of ideas is getting buried under an avalanche of fear and accusation. This is worrisome on a lot of levels, not least the future of democracy, which requires open debate. And I'll just say parenthetically, um, a lot of what I'm talking about here, like in terms of the kinds of charges being brought on campus are involve heterosexual sex. But one of the most interesting civil cases that's, that uh, I've read about in the US is between two men, students, two male students, one of whom accused the other one after a breakup, months after a breakup, of kissing him while he was asleep. And the accuser said that he couldn't have consented because he was asleep. And the university, this was Brandeis, appointed, I think what they called like, it wasn't a special investigator, it was like, a, it was, it had some very Kafkaesque title, like special inquisitor or something. The special inquisitor found that it was true that the student couldn't have consented because he was asleep and kicked the offender off, expelled the offender. Uh, who was found guilty of you know, non-consensual sex. And when this hit the civil court, the judge wrote a very eloquent defense, like which I would paraphrase as, are you kidding me? <laughs> so you know, the, as these cases hit civil court, I mean, it's, it is a reality check in terms of what I have called the sexual paranoia on campus. What's the connection between sex and democracy or sexual ideology and democracy? A central component of current campus sexual ideology, I think, is that sex feels dangerous. For my generation, coming of age in the aftermath of the sexual revolution and related social upheaval, slogans like pleasure and liberation were the ones that got tossed around a lot. The campus culture shifted, and the slogans now tend to be about sexual assault and other encroachments. Stop rape culture, no means no. OK, I know many people will, at this point, probably want to throw a lot of statistics at me that say that one in four or one in five college students experience sexual assault. So how can we talk about liberation? The interesting thing I've learned in my research into these stats uh, on assault is that you can find statistics to back up pretty much whatever story about sexual danger you prefer to tell. From different branches of the US federal government, the very same government, you can find the one in four or five stat, which is cited in the Department of Education's Dear Colleague letters, and you can find stats that say one in 40 students are sexually assaulted from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. The reason, as everyone who's examined these surveys know, is that to begin with, there's no agreement on what sexual assault actually means. It can mean anything from forcible rape to someone trying to kiss you at a party. And of course, these studies all have different methodologies, um, but let's leave that to the statisticians to sort out. The point is that we're in the realm of belief here, not some sort of transparent facts. We won't find out what's happening on the ground from the number crunchers. I'm sure we all agree that any amount of sexual assault is too high, and no people shouldn't try to kiss you who you don't want to kiss you at a party. But I hope that we can all agree that one's view of the world and one's sense of freedom in the world, particularly if you're a woman, is going to be radically different if you opt to believe the one in five stat rather than the one in 40 stat. Before we leave the realm of stats, I'll just mention that the one stat you don't hear on American campuses is the one about the dramatic decline of rape and sexual assault over the last 20 years off campus and on. Every criminologist agrees that violent crime is steeply declined in the US, including sex crime. Um, and these, this data comes from, is based on the Bureau of Justice Statistics Victimization Surveys, which circumvent the problem of underreporting since they're not based on police reports. There's no evidence that sexual assault, as traditionally defined, has risen on campus. What's gone up are the kinds of things being defined as sexual assault, such as drunken sex if someone later complains. And if drunken sex is defined as assault, it means quite a lot of sex on campus has suddenly been criminalized because the definition of consent has been revised. Indeed, people can now change their minds about what was or wasn't consensual months or even years after the fact. And that's one of the chapters in the book is, is based on uh, such a case. A, 
consensual relationship between a graduate student and a professor uh, that the complainant later decided years after the fact had not been consensual after all. How we tell the story of our sex lives is a political choice. Today's activists wish to define more forms of sex as assault than previous generations did because they believe campuses are rape cultures. These are narrative choices. Shifting the narrative toward danger changes the way sex is experienced. We're social creatures, after all, and narrative is how we make sense of the world. If the prevailing narrative is that heterosexual, heterosexual sex is dangerous because men are predators, sex is going to feel threatening more of the time, and everything associated with sex will feel threatening. As you see, we see in the sorts of charges being brought to campus Title IX officers, which now include such offenses as making the wrong eye contact. I mean, I have seen reports on eye contact as an offense, or telling a joke someone takes offense at, at an off-campus bar. And you know, one of the things that I have realized is that Title IX in the US, and perhaps there is equivalent, an equivalent situation here, is being weaponized. In situations, grad students are pressing complaints against other grad students. The, off -camp the joke in the off-campus bar was you know, a grad student pressing a charge against another grad student who had been her former uh, boyfriend. I mean, it became more complicated than that. I've heard of many, many cases about departmental rivalries or turf wars or disputes about hiring where Title IX later becomes used as a weapon. So, I mean, this, these are very murky and messy situations. And it's one of the reasons I have become more and more dubious about Title IX is I have seen how susceptible it is to being manipul manipulated and misused uh, in the current climate. And I have a, there's a, ch a chapter in the book called Fuck Confidentiality, actually F dot dot, you know, star, 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 um, which is a, a just a compilation of some of the cases people emailed me about you know, after I went public and you know, just kind of bullet points about the strange and specious sorts of charges that are being brought. You know, because, it, it, you know, or maybe to take these, maybe on, as good faith, you know, on good faith rather than bad faith, if sex feels dangerous, then a dumb joke can feel like assault, and other people's sexuality becomes encroaching, if not disgusting. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I already talked, I talked about some of the, the uh, non-heterosexual case that's the very interesting one. I haven't come across any cases involving two women or trans students. I'm sure that they exist, but you know, at least in the US, none of this stuff is public, and there's no like database of cases to consult. So I and other people trying to research this are, you know, can only, you can't even really interview people and get both sides of the case because say like, people would tell me their side of a case, they can't give me the name of a complainant that I could go interview because that would uh, subject them to re retaliation charges. So it's a very difficult subject to research. And you don't always know if you're hearing from somebody the entire story. So you know, I did what fact-checking I could in, in those, the cases in the book. But fact-checking is a problem. A few years ago, I was having a conversation with a class about a movie. Uh, I think it was, the opposite. it was the opposite of sex, aptly enough. I, I teach film. A student, female, made a comment assailing the female lead's poor sexual choices, which had led to an unintentional pregnancy, pronouncing a bit Cotton Matherishly, I thought, that's an American reference, <laughs> about the character's irresponsibility and sexual risk-taking, a judgment with which most of the class concurred. My students are all making films and writing screenplays, and the consensus startled me. First, because I spent a lot of energy trying to get students to get that moralizing about characters isn't a great way to go about writing interesting ones. They're not supposed to be upstanding citizens. Uh, second, because we all knew that some percentage of the class, or their peer group anyway, were making similar sexual choices, not infrequently, which is why Plan B birth control is available on demand at the Student Health Service. 
And I know about these things because my students often will tell me at the end of the quarter that a script or film was autobiographical. I mean, I don't ask, but they're all plundering their lives for material. So I think I'm maybe well placed to get a bit more insight into what students are really doing on the ground. So, but these condemnations of this female character struck me as a bit, a bit hypocritical. Everyone lies about sex, I suppose, but I've come to think each generation lies about sex differently. <laughs> I don't tend to teach about, preach about such things to my students, but I did say in this class, just to offer another angle, gosh, I feel sorry for you guys. When I was in school, we thought about sex in terms of pleasure. Your generation seems to think about it all in terms of risk. Another student, male, exclaimed, well, yeah, sex can kill you. I've thought about that remark a lot since then. It was, it was a great lesson in the obvious, which is that this generation of students is also the first post-HIV generation. I started wondering what horrors my students had been exposed to in their sex ed classes, necessarily, I suppose, but still. Obviously, there's nothing new about a youthful education in the hazards of sex. I recall discussing slideshows of syphilitic sex organs in my own junior high sex ed class, as each aging generation is all too pleased to educate the next one in the standard perils, pe pregnancy, disease, shame, spiritual corruption, and so on. The danger of sex is a recurring cultural script, to be sure. Crucially, it shapes gender roles and colors how gender is lived. Women are, after all, situated differently than men when it comes to sexual danger. Though, according to social science research, we typically also feel ourselves to be far more vulnerable to sexual danger than we are. And I can think of no better way to subjugate women than to convince us all that assault is around every corner. Still, for my generation of women, coming of age, post-pill, post-sexual revolution, and after second wave feminism had made at least a few provisional in inroads into female shame and the double standard, sex wasn't exactly uncomplicated, but even when it was bad, as it often was, we didn't think of sex as a harm. That wasn't our narrative. Even sex with teachers, today's cardinal danger, was something a lot of us dabbled in without traumatizing effects. Just to be clear, I'm not trying to say that my generation's story about pleasure was any more true than this one's story about danger. There's no singularly true way of thinking about sex. The truth of sex has been different at every point in history. Every era believes its own sexual narrative to be the truth of sex. And at this point in time, the dominant narrative on campus anyway is all about hazard. But this shift in sexual culture isn't confined to sex alone. It's more like a land grab, gobbling up vast swaths of real estate along the way, including the very definition of what it is to be a woman. When it comes to sexual culture, each generation builds itself as an improvement over the last. No doubt, the slogans about pleasure and liberation were our little lies about sex. The realities were obviously a lot more complicated, especially for women. But today's hazard story also comes with its own evasions, namely a large blind spot when it comes to female agency. In a sexual culture that emphasizes female violation and endangerment, i.e. rape culture, men's power is taken as a given instead of interrogated. Male sexuality is by definition predatory. Women are by definition prey. Men need to be policed. Women need to be protected. Regulators are thus justified in weaving an ever-expanding host of regulation. But this is paternalism, not feminism. Among the weirder features of current campus life is it witnessing a generation of student activists demanding greater regulation over their lives from administrators in contrast to the demands of previous generations of activists that campus officials get out of their lives. When I was in school, the old people, I know just saying that makes me sound like a geezer. <laughs> when I was in school, the old people in charge of things weren't in cahoots with our sexual narrative, which at least provided something bracing to rebel against, an, antith an antithesis, some contestation. Now old people and young ones, or at least the more vocal among the young, all share the same proprieties. 
One argument against the sexual endangerment story is that it complements the political agenda of those running the place. Neoliberalism is a term heard a lot lately. I heard it in the introduction, meaning, as you know, the corporatization of the university, an increased focus on regulation and criminalization in lieu of education, along with an incredible bloating of the administrative ranks. Of course, in the US, Title IX compliance is among the central reasons for the bloat. The staffing up in the sexual misconduct area has been enormous. The ratio of administrators to students has nearly doubled since 1975, while the ratio of faculty to students has stayed constant. And I, I don't know, you know the statistics on the Canadian um, campus. Yes. There's, in, there's a really good book um, by a political scientist named Benjamin Ginsburg called The Fall of the Faculty for people who are interested in this. He calls uh, the, these new positions deanlets. Uh, and so he, he, I don't think he means it as a compliment. <laughs> but you know, the point is that these people are running the place and they have no academic background, they have no historical background, um, and part of, I think, their impetus is to increase their fiefdoms by finding more things to adjudicate and regulate. One thing not much said in the flurry of cliches about campus leftism run amok, the right's favorite charge, uh, is it expanding, I'm kind of repeating what I just sort of said, but it, expanding the reach of campus codes into micro behaviors like eye contact and jokes is a neat way for administrators to consolidate their fiefdoms. If my sense of humor or gaze falls under the jurisdiction of some associate dean, that's a net gain for him or her, right? These administrative hires are seizing the prerogative to set the tenor of the university, and it's a decidedly anti-intellectual tenor. Intellectual life is being sidelined. At least on my campus, none of the people involved in making these regulations uh, are faculty. They're all various permutations of administra administrator. The notion of victimized female students has been a useful pretext for an enormous transfer of power over our lives to institutions and employers. Rights can be suspended because students are in danger. Resources can be diverted from education to the administration because students are in danger. All this comes wrapped in a vaguely feminist veneer, but if this is what passes for feminism, then feminism is broken. What we're seeing are hard-won rights, namely the right for women to be treated as consenting adults in erotic matters, being relinquished without a peep, traded away for the pleasures of blame and pipe dreams of safety. I mean, as Samir mentioned, a, few, a couple of months ago I spoke at Wellesley. It's a women's college, private women's college in the Northeast. Beforehand, someone sent me an article about a student protest over a statue of a man in his undershorts outside the art museum a couple of years ago. Um, there had been a petition to move the statue indoors, and it got over a thousand signatures on Facebook, although I'm not sure they were all students, because this statue was regarded as potentially triggering or otherwise offensive. Um, it's the, it's, he's, not, you know, it's, he's not clothed, but he does have undershorts on, and he's, he's quite pudgy. <laughs> I, am, I actually went to art school. I started out as a video artist, um, which is why I end up teaching film, and came of age thinking that offensive art was the most interesting art there was. This is, after all, the legacy of the avant-garde. I still tend to think that encountering something offensive, and I am actually as easily offended, if not more so than anyone here, I assure you, but being offended forces me into an encounter with my own boundaries in ways that more benign experiences don't. It's educational, which is why I'm someone who once wrote an essay on Larry Flint and Hustler magazine, which evolved into a book on pornography, even though I don't particularly like pornography. It's true. <laughs> People are thinking, she's protesting too much. <laughs> but I also wanted to figure out why what's offensive often feels endangering, when objectively it's not. I wasn't going to let this magazine have that power over me. Forcing myself to read Hustler, and it is completely disgusting, made me realize that it was more complicated than I'd thought previously. A lot of it is about class resentment and deploys grossness as an attack on social elites. Part of my own disgust certainly had to do with how steeped in bourgeois proprieties my own sensibilities are. In the end, Hustler had no power over me. In fact, I had power over it. 
The same would be true of a sculpture of a pudgy guy in his underwear. This too is a case where critical thinking has more power than a petition. Uh, and as, as an aside, I don't tend to think that trauma theory has been particularly, a particularly beneficial thing for feminism, especially if it turns its, its adherence into would-be censors, which is something I'd like to write more about at some point in the future. I want to conclude by saying something about the perils of zealotry. One valuable lesson I've learned from my recent experiences of coming under fire on my campus, and something I'd wish to convey to all aspiring brimstoners and censors, is that zealotry can boomerang in unanticipated ways. Because my Title IX complainants overplayed their hand by trying to bend Title IX into an all-purpose bludgeon, I ended up meeting the accused philosophy professor, Peter Ludlow, on my campus. I, I had not met him at the time I wrote those couple of paragraphs. I interviewed him. I read the confidential files on his case, which he bequeathed to me after he resigned his position under fire. The more I learned about his situation, the more I saw it as a lens through which the current paranoia on campus came into focus. So I ended up writing a book about his case and the other cases like his that I learned about, uh, which I doubt my accusers are especially thrilled about, uh, and which I hope will cause a bit of a shitstorm uh, <laughs> and prompt a lot more discussion about the out of control Title IX apparatus and whatever you know, equivalent sorts of prosecutions are going on here. And just you know, parenthetically, since um, Samir mentioned the accusations against people like Searle. Um, I believe it's important to keep in mind that an accusation does not prove guilt. And I sometimes hear back channel stuff about some of these cases. And you know, I know that there's this kind of mantra that we're supposed to, all we write thinking people are supposed to believe that accusers don't lie or accusers you know, don't make up facts or you know, that kind of thing. I, don't think that's true. And I also know, and the Barnett case um, that I write about in, at the University of Colorado, where a student got an $825,000 payout uh, on charges that were later discovered to be, uh, it looked like, falsified. And she was later brought up on Title IX complaints herself after receiving the 825 or maybe with 75 payout. I just think you know we have to suspend judgment and wait for the facts to come out in these cases. And sometimes the facts don't come out because of confidentiality agreements. But I just um, think you have to take every case, you know, not assume that because one philosophy professor did some crappy things, they all have done. So I would just caution about leaping to conclusions. Um, one of the things I also risk saying in the book is that we feminists have been very quick to indict the pathologies of masculinity, like hyperaggression, while being a bit more reluctant to turn the gaze in the other direction, that is, on ourselves, and take a look at the pathologies of femininity. For example, I know from my own students that women tossing down shots like the guys is seen as a sign of gender progress these days. But the reality, especially as far as campus assault, the campus assault issue is far more complicated. Because the practical, physiological reality is that if you're going shot for shot with a guy, women tend to pass out first. Another reality is that booze promotes stereotypical gender behavior, not just increased male aggressivity, but stereotypical female behavior too, namely female passivity, female helplessness, because who's more helpless than a passed out woman? Let me say that I fully believe women should be, should be able to pass out wherever they want, naked even, and be inviolable. One hopes such social conditions will someday arrive. The practical issue is that acting as if things were different from how they are isn't thus far working out. Nor is the self-martyrdom of saying that men have to change first and that uh, acting pragmatically would be capitulating to rape culture which is one of the mantras of, of activists. From where I sit, that looks like the old female passivity in a slightly edgier wardrobe. And turning our gazes only to male pathologies rather than examining our own makes us gender hypocrites. 
It's depressing how obdurate traditional gender positions turn out to be, even in the midst of all the exciting new challenges to gender binaries. Yes, I realized, I feel from the silence and the intake of breaths in the room, <laughs> I realized I ventured into dangerous terrain here. But something I've been thinking about, and one of those middle of the night, how to live sorts of questions, is whether I want to be someone who allows herself to be shut up by critics or backs down for fear of ruffling feathers, rather than saying what I actually think is true. I've decided that I don't want to back down, which actually solved the writer's block issue. <laughs> I wrote unwanted advances in like a year, which is warp speed for me, 60,000 words, just like poured out. As you've probably gathered, going through a Title IX investigation, though my case was nothing compared to what others have been through, I still have a job, at least for the moment, has left me a little mad and possibly a little dangerous, <laughs> Trans transformed from a harmless ironist into an aspiring whistleblower. It's just these sorts of unintended consequences that a more psychologically shrewd band of zealots could have predicted. I mean, having been hauled up on complaints once, what do I now have to lose? <laughs> Confidentiality, conduct befitting a professor. To quote myself from the closing line of the book's preface, kiss my ass. <laughs> In other words, thank you to my accusers and would-be censors for being such wonderful muses. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, wonderful. So I, I just wanted to say one thing, and that was I... Um, uh, um, forgot to mention in my introductory remarks that uh, unlike um, Title IX, which you describe as uh, pretty much left to individual institutions to interpret and kind of yes. make up as they go along, yes. and it's the administrators who are doing this, yeah. um, SFU has just um, finalized and, and adopted March 30th uh, its new sexual assault policy, and that entailed um, the participation of, of faculty, uh, I think staff and, and students as well as mainly faculty. Yeah. And we have some of the architects in the oh. room tonight, so I, I oh, hope we can have, have a discussion about that uh, as mm -hmm. well. Um, so I'd, I'd like to open it up, and I, I, I was thinking that maybe we take three questions in a row, and then, okay. then you answer the three, and then we move okay. on to another batch. Okay. Would that be okay? If my memory, yeah, I can try that. Two? <laughs> yeah. Three. Okay. You three can remind work. me if there's something I didn't, yeah, sure. sure. That's yeah. a good idea. Good. So, floor is officially open. Yes, Sierra. Hi. Um, in the introduction, Hello. I believe you talk about um, um, this idea of trauma, and it's prescribed now something that never goes away. Um, and I just thought that was a really significant point. I'm not sure if it was really talked about in the rest of the book, so I just wondered if you could expand on that. Um, trauma as being kind of like this terminal diagnosis. So. Okay. Great. Next question. Um, I wanted to ask you about a recent editorial that was published in the New York Times. I think it was by uh, Vice Provost Bauer of Northwestern. And he was speaking about the test for uh, protesting a speaker should be something like if that speaker denies the humanity of one uh, interlocutor, then they uh, will rightly be protest. Um, but it seems to me that that uh, sort of prejudices discussions. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Mm -hmm. And a third question. Yes, sure. Um, this pretty much follows up on the first question, actually. And I was just curious, having um, gone to high school in the 90s and university in the 90s, and things have changed a lot. Uh, when I was a kid, if my grandmother thought I was being a crybaby, she would tell me to stop crying, or she'd give me a better reason to cry. That was like very typical in the <laughs> 70s, right? Not considered abusive. And this idea that trauma is permanent and insurmountable in some way did not exist in those days. I was just wondering if you could give a kind of maybe archaeology of trauma for us. Where does, where does this... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got all night, so... You know. <laughs> oh, good. Um, thanks, thanks for the talk, by the way. You know, 
I was not somebody exactly prepared to be in the middle of this free speech debate. You know, I, I was not prepared. I mean, I kind of mock myself as I'm like the least likely candidate to be an activist, you know, around. I mean, I, as they say, I was like a harmless ironist. I'm not a joiner. So I've been trying to puzzle through a lot of these issues, and I'm not, frankly, myself entirely sure where I stand on all of these free speech issues. I mean, I do feel as a professor, you know, on a campus, I do feel campuses are communities. And I mean, if I were writing regulations, I might put some limits on speech that um, den denies the humanity of another person or hate speech. I'm not against hate speech codes, and I know some diehard free speech liberals that I've encountered, you know, are shocked that I would say something like that. And also, given that I myself have come under attack for speech, like at Wellesley, um, uh, I'm probably putting myself in danger by saying that. But I mean, I am a little equivocal on the total free speech. I don't want to, I don't want to invite Milo to my campus or that kind of thing. So I'm, a, I mean, I'm just, frankly, if people have like, better ideas about where to draw those lines. I'm interested in them. So I'm not entirely um, sure. But I will just say, in, in the Wellesley faculty letter saying that I shouldn't have been invited, they cited Jelani Cobb's work. And he had um, published a piece, I think it was in the New Yorker, maybe elsewhere, saying that free speech isn't really free because not everybody you know, has access to free speech and that it itself is a classed and you know, raced uh, kind of position, um, but he, I actually spoke to him after this, felt that they had very much misused his work, um, the people who were saying that I, you know, was causing distress to the student, the Wellesley students by them having to combat my ideas. So anyway, I think that was a long way of saying I'm, I'm not, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> But, and I also don't, I can't exactly give you a lineage of, or a genealogy of, of trauma. I do say, I make a kind of joke about it, although it's not really a joke about, it's like a virus. I mean, it sort of, in a way, took the place of the fears of herpes and HIV, you know, as you catch a virus from sex, it will never, never go away. Now you catch trauma. And I mean, there's some lineage that started with uh, this incest survivor literature of the 70s, people like Judith Herman, who wrote this book about in, in this term survivor that's gotten adopted by campus activists to you know talk about people, not only who have been sexually assaulted or raped, but sometimes who have just had bad sexual experiences. And one of the problems with the term survivor is that it's applied even by campus officials to people who have just lodged an accusation rather than to somebody where the accusation has been adjudicated and it has found to be, like, has been upheld. So I've gotten official letters from my camp, from, on the campus about accu accusers needing to be notified of the findings of a, like an assault charge, but they don't use the term accuser, they use the term survivor. And I actually wrote the general counsel at the university saying, how can you in an official document use the word survivor to refer to an accuser because that presumes the guilt before it's been established of the person who's been accused. So that's part of the whole due process issue, the assumption of guilt uh, following from an accusation. Anyway, so if you wanted to know more about the, lin the, this, the genealogy of trauma, I would probably start with somebody like Judith Herman and incest, uh, survivors of incest, and where that started to become discussed more in the 70s. I mean, of course, the term survivor you know, goes back to uh, the camps and Holocaust survivors. But one of the interesting resonances of this term survivor and the trauma stuff is that it starts to make, like say, professor-student accusations take on the stigma of incest, uh, if, if you see what I mean. I mean, like the, the discourse of surviving incest has sort of leaked into or seeped into the discourse around professor-student relationships. So that becomes like another, like almost at this point, a, the viol violation of the incest taboo. And one of the things, I'll say one more thing sort of briefly that I've been thinking about uh, in relation to this is 
there's a new stigma and sensitivity around intergenerational sex at the moment in the way that there wasn't like when I was younger. And you know, now, if you talk about, say, like an age difference between two people of 20 years, people go, ew. You know, where throughout history, an age difference between two people was really no big thing and was in many cases fairly normal. And on campuses, you know, look around. You have zillions of couples, oftentimes long-standing couples who have children, you know, they've been married for 20 years, who started out as professor, student, uh, you know, former students, professors and former students, whereas now that's regarded as, like as I say, criminal, almost incest, shocking to be um, uh, out, outlawed because power has taken on a different kind of meaning in those uh, circumstances. But one of the things I noticed when on my campus when they banned professors and undergrads dating was none of these couples, these married couples who started out as professors in professor-student situations or former students, none of these people came forward and said, well, wait a second, are we predators? Were we criminals? Are we, you know, so it's, there's a lot of hypocrisy and looking the other way about the ways that these norms have shifted very fast. And no sense of history. I mean, no sense of perspective. And maybe it's just getting like really old that you know allows me to have some perspective on this stuff. Because I remember when you know these were norms, not taboos. So it just does does say you know sexuality is just a constantly shifting set of norms. Sorry, yeah, that was a long thing. As well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. married as high school <laughs> teacher. Scandal for other reasons. Yeah. <laughs> That's how he, he, yeah, he's seen as feisty and, okay. Good, so, yes, please. Um, as a student myself, I'm, as a student myself, I'm sympathetic to your critique that we've become somewhat of a class of impotent rebels, but I'm hoping that you could expand on a critique, you know, of the institution that is producing us and how it's heavily depoliticized, especially the humanities programs while simultaneously indebting us and bankrupting us, you know, intellectually as well as economically? Um, These are big yeah, questions. I, I, I would also like to, to invite more students uh, to participate in this. Okay, being bankrupted. Um, so, uh, given that you're speaking in Canada, um, I'm interested in a lot of what you said about the U.S. context, and I'm begging for um, a citation list to some of your uh, points. Um, and I'm sure it's in your book, so I'll check that out. Um, but in Canada, I think it's worth noting, so this province just recently, as Simeon noted, this province recently passed legislation mandating um, all the universities to have policies dealing with uh, sexual misconduct and sexual violence. So SFU just went through that uh, process. It's I think worth noting that nowhere in SFU policy um, do all uh, relationships between faculty and students at all forbidden. Um, there is one notation that there may be a conflict of interest when there was a direct yeah. um, uh, uh, like supervisory grading relationship, but it's only may. Um, and it's also, I think, important to note that um, you talk about the, the use of the word survival. Again, here at, our, at SFU, um, it was the institution that insisted on using the term survival throughout that policy, despite the fact that a huge number of um, students, faculty, and other members of the community noted that it was a problematic term to use, not only because it's actually fundamentally neoliberal, so to frame someone as a survival, um, it, places the emphasis on uh, how one deals with a certain experience rather than having dealt, had a certain experience. Mm -hmm. And as you say, may kind of frame like a lifetime of experience based on that. But I, I have to admit, I feel like most of what you're talking about was locating a lot of um, the problematics of, of this whole dynamic with um, individual students and with student um, and community rights groups, whereas there was an example of it actually being the institution that is forcing a kind of um, language and framework that was not that was actually explicitly rejected by community members. Um, and I would so I would just bring it back to I understand that you're coming from an American context, but a lot of what you're saying, frankly, doesn't apply to specifically the BC context. And I also you noted one last thing. I know I'm I'm doing the the 
thing. Um, but one last thing, you said that um, faculty had almost no uh, say in what happened at your university. Um, the majority of faculty at, at Canadian universities are unionized, so that is power that they have taken for themselves as workers, and they have explicit ability to, um, to enact that power and to keep these kinds of, the kinds of things that you're saying are so rampant from happening. And so I guess I would just question your frame of the power in all of this. Um, perhaps it's just an American thing, but it really doesn't seem to, to play in terms of this context. Thank you. Actually, I just wanted to clarify. So I'm Genevieve Johnson, uh, Department of Political Science and Associate Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Um, so I also uh, was involved in the development of our sexual violence uh, mm -hmm. and misconduct policy here at SFU. And it's true, we do use the term survivor. It wasn't that the institution insisted on using this language. Uh, rather, uh, the language came out of really lengthy discussions and meetings that we had between the 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 usual suspects, the administrators, and then the advisory group. Um, and we did uh, actually soften the language uh, in, the, in the policy uh, to ensure that uh, a complainant or a survivor or a victim, however uh, they would like to be identified, that choice will be respected. Um, taking this back into more of a question sort of uh, for the speaker, um, yeah, so I teach uh, feminist social and political thought, and I also teach a course in, in uh, sexuality and in, in sex, love, and politics. And I'm not seeing so much a discourse of danger. Uh, I am seeing more of a discourse of uh, minimizing risks to maximize sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the context um, at SFU anyway, and it's been my experience, I think is quite different from the context in, in the US. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around consent, the importance of consent, um, and uh, the policy that we developed um, speaks to the importance of minimizing risks and trying to reduce uh, the occurrence of sexual violence on our campus, while also upholding uh, principles of due process and procedural fairness. And so we use the language of survivor when, um, when an individual is uh, disclosing, uh, but when an individual launches a formal complaint, that individual becomes a complainant. So the, the, I guess I'm just kind of painting, uh, sort of uh, providing some context um, to the, mm -hmm. the, the case here at SFU. A final, I guess this is my question for you. So we've just, with the, with the discussions around the policies uh, at SFU, we've really been trying to minimize barriers to disclosing because we know that, that sexual violence is massively underreported. And so how do you respond to critics who claim that your work is actually creating barriers uh, to, to, to disclosing these very, what can be very serious and very traumatizing uh, occurrences. Well, I'll start with that. Uh, um, I mean, I think there, even if it's, uh, these are painful discussions, I mean, I just think there has to be more transparency to these processes. Um, I mean, I'm very happy to hear that this is a more enlightened place than, you know, the place that I am at or that, you know, what's, what's going on across the United States. Um, and, you know, hopefully it'll stay that way as opposed to, you know, following the American model where these issues of consent um, are also being kind of weaponized. I mean, like, there's a case, what's the terms like you, you have consent codes being written um, in the US where they have this language, consent should be active and ongoing and enthusiastic and you know, you've probably read about and but what happens in situations where there's a dispute between mostly two students is um, the consent issue gets decided after the fact, behind closed doors, there's no transparency. Um, students, you know, an accused student doesn't have rights. So I suppose what I'm trying to say, and maybe this makes me unpopular, is that there are two sides to these stories when there's an accusation. And the accused 
unless we want to live in, you know, we in the U.S. want to live in a police state, you know, the rights of the accused have to be factored in, and that isn't happening. So uh, it's easier and more expedient for campuses to, to expel an accused student than to give that person due process. And to the person over here, I just think you're wrong if you say that I am putting the um, emphasis on student activists as dictating the policy. I mean, I talked throughout about federal policy in the US Title IX you know, and the institutions, and they do uh, have some discretion about how they adopt in the US these, um, uh, I mean, the, there's a mandate that they adopt sets of procedures to adjudicate sexual assault, but not, they're not, it's not said specifically how to do it. So the result is overreach. I mean, the result, the result is erring on the side of criminalizing uh, and rushing to judgment when there's an accusation. So that, I mean, that just has been the fact. And I mean, it's very interesting to hear that faculty have been involved in uh, drawing up these procedures here. But I was just yesterday in, uh, at the University of Oregon at Eugene, and um, what I heard from people there, including people who've been accused of things, is that it's actually administrators making the decisions about firing faculty who've been accused of something. So if the, the process is secret, and the final decision, even when somebody has tenure, is in the hands of administrators and people don't have any academic background. So you know, it's, it's all over the place procedurally, and maybe there's more uniformity here, which would be great, and, but I mean, uh, in Eugene, which is you know not that far from here, although across the border, um, you know there's all sorts of unproceduralism going on, even in a place where there is a faculty union. So you know there's so many disparate situations. I can't actually kind of keep them all into account, take them all into account. And maybe I am guilty of generalizing to some degree based on all the evidence that's come my way. So there's certainly going to be different uh, different situations. You know, what, one issue um, to go back about the, this language of survivor, I mean, I think it also does, and this goes back to the question, questions about trauma, discussion about trauma, I mean, it kind of intersects with identity politics. And I mean, I'm certainly not somebody who is going to protest against identity politics, but the way, you know, which I mean has been hugely important in many sorts of claims and claims for social justice and distribution, economic distribution and, and so on. But the label survivor becomes an identity also. I mean, it transforms an experience into an identity that doesn't go away. So, and that seems to be part of the point of adopting that language of survivor is that, you know, I mean, in many cases, identity claims allow people, you know, a certain kind of access to public, forums and that sort of thing, but you know, it's not just trauma that doesn't go away, it's the identity as a survivor. And you know, there's a lot of stuff to, to say about that. Um, this first, the first question about the bank, bankrupting of students, I mean, it's sort of a bit back to the question I didn't answer, probably about you know, when we were young, our parents said, toughen up, you know. And you know, there's this language that, again, comes from the right about parenting practices, which does attempt to individualize, uh, individualize these issues. Like parents, it's you know, the helicopter parenting or the coddling of students. You hear that kind of language a lot to account for uh, you know, the special snowflake syndrome, you know, which is a term I learned from my own students who acknowledge the millennials that they, them, you know, see themselves as all special, I assume you've heard this term, this special snowflake. I, I've tried to stay away from that. I mean, in writing about this stuff, I very much try to not dump on students. I mean, I really try to focus on the institutions, um, staying away from, you know, making prescriptions about parenting and, and that sort of thing, because it's very easy to get, for this discussion to get co-opted, and perhaps my, arguments have been by people I don't necessarily want to be allied with politically. So all of the speech issues, the issues about millennials and their uh, desires to be um, 
special snowflakes or whatever, you know, I, I really just try to step around that as much as I can. So, I mean, there's just like a mind, minefield after minefield in this uh, subject politically, just, you know, as, as I say, even on the speech stuff that I'm tr trying to sort out myself. I'm not sure, did I get to all, I sort of, I think, roamed around all three questions, maybe? Uh, yeah. Hi, Laura. It's Clint. Um, oh, hi, Clint. <laughs> a couple, a couple of things. I, I was, wanted to get you to talk a bit more about safety, or safety on campus, or safe spaces, and so on. But first of all, that helicopter parenting thing. I think some universities now provide reading lists for parents so they can read along with their students yeah. in their first year of classes. So I can imagine them reading Naked Lunch if they're in my class, and they might be a bit upset. But the idea of, of safe spaces, um, we had a great, uh, who's a Brenda Taylor, who just retired as our legal sort of person, who was this, swore like a sailor, you know, and, and when I would, I went to her a couple different times about parents complaining to me or students complaining to me, she says, you know, fuck safety on a campus, right? Of course, physical safety, of course, but not intellectual or ideological safety. So I wonder if, if you want to talk about the weaponizing or the metastasizing of discourses of safety uh, in, the, in the university itself and, you know, and, yeah, what, what's the, what is the discourse? Why is it happening? <laughs> also in the theater. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, this is maybe going to be a lot to remember with, um, <laughs> with Clint's question, okay. but I just wanted um, to ask you if you could talk more about consent. So one of the issues that happened here was the Gian Gameshi case, and one of the things that I heard over and over again was a kind of um, yes means no, or ultimately means no in terms of consent. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the difficulty is that if we deny that yes means no, we're doing we have a problem, and yet if we respect it in a way, we also have a problem. And so I think that there's just a lot of confusion around consent and, and how we're to understand it in this context. So maybe you could attempt to clarify or, or see if there's a, maybe another kind of archaeology of, of consent. <laughs> Am I understanding what you're saying, though? Do you mean no means yes? Is that, I'm not sure what well, ye, is that yes uh, means no. I'm not well, sure. uh, no, I think, I think what I mean is that is... Oh, changing your mind. About changing consent. your mind. Yeah. You know, it's, the, yeah. it's consensual the time and then, or it's like, like the mattress yeah. girl. The, it, 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 it's yes at the time and then it's no. And yeah. how, are, how are we to sort that out if we're, if we're to respect people's consent choices, mm -hmm. which are important? Mm -hmm. Would it be all right? Mine's quite, quite related. I'm sorry. I did have a Sorry. Uh, uh, so I also wanted to ask about consent. Uh, so you, you mentioned um, at, at one point this uh, pattern of, um, I think you, you, you describe it sometimes as after the fact withdrawal of consent. And you mentioned a case where a student, uh, as you put it, had been in a consensual relationship and then years later um, said, uh, mm -hmm. withdrew consent. And I guess I just wanted to ask, given the fact that it's, you know, it's possible to be in an abusive relationship. It's possible to be in an, an unconsensual relationship. It's indeed possible to be in a consensual relationship and to be sexually assaulted. And since we have so many um, barriers to reporting when that happens, it is sometimes going to be the case that sometime later one does decide to come forward. And from the outside, that'll look a lot like this kind of case you're complaining about. And indeed, the, the Gomeshi case, I think, it had a lot of these features. When you look at the reasons that, uh, that Jameshi walked, they, they said, oh, well, they didn't, they didn't, they kind of acted normal at the time. They continued to have a, a professional relationship. Um, and so, um, you know, we're going to look from the outside and decide this wasn't a case, uh, sorry, this, this, this was a consensual relationship where she changed her mind. And I just wonder how, how we make that call. I mean, it's inc oh, there, another another one. <laughs> yeah. I I gotta keep it really quick. Um, I was a support person for somebody who was accused on a campus in BC, and um, you mentioned your concern about due process, which I, after my experience as the support person, we didn't even know a lot of the accusations against him. Actually, we had to wait till the final report until we knew what the full accusations were. So I'm hoping that you're like putting some thought into what you think that could look like in the future, in terms of what it means, and also. I think that to some degree, these um, tribunals are looked at as an alternative to proper due process through the courts, as if it's some sort of therapy. And I don't think that therapy um, is, is suited to a tribunal or a court system. I think that therapy is suited to a therapist. So this was in the Canadian, this was here? 
This was at UBC, yes. Um, so that's very interesting, just the people are saying, oh, it's all very different here in Canada, you know, just so behind We're, we're only doors. behind you in the lawsuits. I'm sorry? We're only behind you in the lawsuits. Yeah, okay. But so behind closed doors, I think for what you're saying, your experience is some of these same issues are exactly happening where the accused is, yeah, not knowing the charges, finding them out later in terms of the report, and that's exactly what I have heard over and over in the U.S., and the issue about these tribunals being a form of therapy, they may be, but other people's lives are being ruined in the process, you know, the accused. And so, again, if you don't want to live in a police state, that's something to take into consideration. And this does become the issue of consent. And I, I mean, the question you asked me to, like, oh, well, how do we decide if somebody changes their mind years later uh, about whether something was or wasn't consensual? I mean, it's one of the questions everybody has to figure out as citizens. Is this, are these forms of redress things we want to turn over to administrators and bureaucrats or, um, you know, tribunals or whatever? I mean, if maybe in some future form of community justice where there were panels and people who'd had bad sexual experience could appear before the panel and describe the injury that they'd suffered and the panel would discuss it and pronounce on it and you know, somebody else would have to go to therapy or something. You know, maybe in some more humane world such uh, you know, maybe these things could be adjudicated. But the question is, what is the threshold, uh, you know, beyond which or below which you just have to sort of figure, that was a bad experience, I'm going to go to therapy, work it out, talk to my friends, not do that again, you know, whatever, um, versus seeking formal redress. So, and that is a question that is very, a very individual one. You know, I talked to one of my own students who'd had somebody, she'd gotten drunk, passed out, had sex with somebody that she didn't remember, uh, and she was describing this. And I said, you know, some people would say you were raped. Uh, I'm not saying that, but, you know, on campus, that would be what that experience was called. And she said, well, I would have hooked up with him anyway. I just, you know, unfortunately didn't you know, get to experience it. So, you know, and she said, I mean, she had just resolved to drink less after freshman year because the sex wasn't usually very good if you were both, you know, on the verge of passing out. So, you know, here's somebody that treated it as an educational experience where somebody else would go to a campus, um, you know, a Title IX officer and press charges and, you know, a, the kid could end up, uh, the, the male student usually end up uh, expelled from school. And in the US, you know, you've got this thing called the common application. So a student that's expelled in one of these tribunals, uh, oftentimes without knowing what he's even been accused with, can't get into another school because you have to say if you've been kicked out of a school on a sexual, some sort of misconduct charge. So um, these are tough questions in terms of this, you know, what is consent, what isn't consent. Um, one of the cases I talk about was a freshman kid who asked his girlfriend, they were in a steady relationship, more than once for a blowjob, and they later broke up. She decided that that had been coercion. She complied for like 30 seconds, and he realized she wasn't into it. They stopped. She then brought charges. He was expelled because it was labeled by the student dean emotional coercion. So what that means, and one of the things I haven't talked about as much, is the gender assumptions built into this stuff. So the finding was that this freshman kid, the girlfriend was a year older, he had so much power over her that he could emotionally coerce her, and the experience, the 30 seconds of oral sex had been so horrifying that this kid was expelled from school on that basis. So this was a case of consent where somebody changed her mind, you know, and decided that had been a not consensual experience, and that was the result. So I don't, you know, I don't know where we draw the lines. Maybe somebody has a better idea, has a good idea. Are you guys going to answer where? Okay. Well, let me just. Um, <laughs> Still answering. This. Yeah. Sorry, I've been a bit long-winded. Um, maybe um, I'm on a different time zone, so I'm starting to ramble. Um, the safety uh, issue, um, 
You know, I mean, back to this question about intergener the intergenerational issue at the moment, the parenting issue. I mean, one of the things that is the case is that kids are, my kids are best friends with their parents. I mean, there's a change in family culture, I think, and I don't know what to make of it, but you know, the parents and the kids are best friends. There's a different kind of level of authority that parents have over kids, which is none. You know, so the, um, <laughs> I, you know, and I mean, I, I don't want to again fall into the uh, hand basket of the right and talk about coddled kids, um, but there are, I mean, there just simply are, I think, particularly in our upper middle class or middle class families, changes in the kind of parenting and family culture that I think do produce different expectations on campus, uh, on campuses, and you know, particularly about cons in the context of consumerism. I mean, students really feel much more like consumers now and entitled to concierge service, and that includes feeling comfortable intellectually. I mean, physically, everybody should feel safe, but not having experiences that are disruptive uh, intellectually or emotionally. I don't know what to say about it. I, you know. I think somebody over there has a question. something yeah, to so say. Hold on. I, before we move on to people who are poised to, to ask questions, or uh, I ask, invite, give me answers. I, I'd like to in, invite more questions from students, if if there are uh, any. Did you want so? If we can send out a microphone. I think that would be very nice. This one? Oh, there's one right there, right behind you. Yes. Maybe the students have answers instead of questions. Yeah, I'm happy to be enlightened. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Thank you. Um, my question is, I thought it was interesting that you um, called the administrations um, in the universities in these cases paternalistic, um, and also mentioned that we should keep an eye to history in the evolution of the academy and um, the administration of the academy. We know that the academy, of course, has always been a patriarchal institution. You talked about the incest prohibition between uh, the professor and the student, which I thought was interesting, because, of course, Plato himself um, talked about the sublimated love the Erastus has for his Eromenos. Um, so there is a, a prohibition there, which for him served a function. Freud, as well, talks about the way that um, a young boy attending school, and in his generation, that would be very patriarchal, male professors and male students, that that situation encouraged male homosexuality. So, given that these sexual feelings are, let's say, natural or present in the academy, should they then be given free reign? Or should there be um, a means to regulate them? And is there a possibility that this regulation in the academy could have a quality that wasn't paternalistic? We see, of course, many women entering the academy these days, can that radically change the way that the academy is organized? Thanks. Can I just briefly answer that before sure. I forget? Because there's, there's so many interesting points. I mean, I use the term, maybe I invented it, if I'm happy to copyright it, of feminist paternalism. I mean, there are more and more women, as you're saying, in administrative positions. When we say paternal, these institutions are paternalist, that doesn't mean it's men enacting the paternalism. I mean, I do think, the versions of feminism, what you I would call campus feminism, have a distinctly paternalistic uh, tenor to them. So, um, so I think part of the lineages or genealogies have to do with the different and competing strands or versions of feminism that are uh, prevailing and their politics. So I believe that the what I've called campus feminism or feminist paternalism is actually a very conservative form of feminism. And I don't think all forms of feminism are progressive. So that would be one uh, you know, comment ab about that. The other thing is, I mean, if we're talking about making codes, like should this be prohibited or not prohibited, like faculty, student, relationships, I think it goes back to, I'm, tr I'm trying to get a, precede that question and talk about this new uh, sexual ideology or this emotional uh, content of sex at this moment as feeling dangerous in a way that it didn't before. So the regulations proceed from the shift in sexual culture toward danger. So before you can decide should students and professors 
have sex or not have sex or have be allowed to be romantic uh, with each other or not, I think you have to disentangle this uh, sense of sex as a harm, you know. So I think that's the place to start, rather than the regulation, if if that makes sense. Great. So um, we've got three more questions. We've got Pascal coming back, and I think that will probably take ten Try to now keep your questions brief, so we can. Sure. So I can ramble a lot in the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, the question I wanted to ask. Uh, thanks for your talk, by the way. Um, I, what I heard through your talk, I heard, I heard an echo, or um, one, maybe it's one of the voices that's talking through you, was Camille Paglia, um, and, and her, you know, based on her, and she, I feel like, she, or I think, I think she, she was giving this very similar uh, points maybe 20 to 25 years ago. Um, and maybe I just, I'm curious how, if, you, if you're aware of her work and if you could comment on her work and how you differentiate yourself from her. Uh, the second thing that I'm, uh, I'm interested in is, is uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, speech that was uh, just maybe a couple days ago where she wanted to join the fight against Trump now after 100 days. And uh, without mentioning neoliberalism, you know, without mentioning how she, I mean, she, she, she wanted to maybe, maybe slightly take some of the responsibility for losing the election, but um, she, she, she again this this uh, this narrative of misogyny, which is not to say it didn't happen. It wasn't that that misogyny is not reality, and that Trump wasn't misogynist, and that he isn't a misogynist person. But to put it as the central issue, I think is the flaw was the flaw of her campaign, um, from my perspective. And maybe maybe uh, so I so I see this um, sexual um, paranoia with an institution growing up right up to the presidential race. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, mine is actually less of a question, more of a comment, but I just wanted to speak also to against the enlightenment of Canada uh, versus the United States. I'm a faculty member in Ontario, uh, so a few provinces away, and we've already had a, um, a similar mandate given by the provincial government that all universities need to, come, need to come up with a sexual violence policy by January 2017. And so I've been embroiled in my own campus's um, debates about that. And uh, the, it is, you know, it's very heated, it's very debate, it's very divided. Um, and I see there, disappointingly, both at my university and universities across Ontario, hardly any consideration of, of uh, the accused, as you mentioned, which uh, is, you know, just hugely problematic in terms of, you know, who we think uh, campus community is. Uh, you know, no consideration. It's, it's so focused on, on students, which is great, but there are also considerations for faculty, of course, but also for staff. And staff have been just totally sidelined from these, uh, these, de these debates and these conversations. And I, you know, that's particularly important for me and some of my colleagues because of the way that breaks down along uh, lines of race, right? So faculty of color, men of color, are just not, not prioritized as, you know, uh, um, or not just faculty, but sorry, staff or students. Um, being prioritized as constituencies that need to be, you know, talked with when we're developing these policies. Um, and the other thing that's missing from the, our discussions um, and the policies that I see coming out is a consideration of academic freedom from our end of things. And so I had an administrator tell me, uh, well, we'll know, we'll be able to say, um, you know, like I basically brought up this question of like, well, what if I teach, you know, such and such novel in my class, I'm a, a legal theorist. Well, that wouldn't be appropriate because I'm not doing sexuality studies. So that's, now the, now the administration is saying that. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's any debate or any, any caution or people thinking that, oh, well, that's just this one campus, we can look to the Supreme Court of Canada, which just uh, a couple of years ago had a case before it called JA, where the Supreme Court of Canada basically instituted, you know, juridified a paternalism that said, even if a woman, a woman gives consent to have sex or have something done to them while unconscious, that is not possible. Women cannot give consent to have something done to them while unconscious, even if they gave consent while they're unconscious or sleeping, not possible, right? So um, it's a bigger problem, I think, than, we're, than we think. Yes, please. Oh, you got one. Uh, yeah. No, I, uh, boy, I, uh, so I'll try and make this short. Uh, the, the uh, one that you, you, dismissed sort of statistics early on, or early on, and I'm a scientist, so that didn't really <laughs> jive with me. And it, I mean, it's been 30 or 40 years that we've been collecting statistics on mm -hmm. sexual assault and mm -hmm. 
I think, you know, I, I don't buy the idea that you can just pick whatever number you want. There must be uncertainty around that, and I think we can all accept that. Uh, but once you dismiss that, then you move quickly into the, the realm, as you did, of, of anecdote. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there are a few other anecdotes that I am aware of. There's a professor at Berkeley in, in astrophysics who just resigned. Mercy. Uh, uh, who was a star. Jeff and Mercy. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I was visiting while he, the faculty as, actually learned that they, this was going to go public. And uh, basically the, the chair said, well, you know, uh, we knew about this. It was an issue. You know, women came to us, but you know, they would, didn't want to be named because they were postdocs and they were moving on in their careers. It would damage their careers. And so the corrective that normally should be provided in those circumstances uh, was, was, you know, they were prohibited from actually, you know, t saying anything to the faculty <coughs> member because of some, you know, the, the, the rules around this. And then there, you know, that's one example. But there's other more famous examples. There's a guy named Roger Ailes, who's a, you know, I mean, and uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, the other guy at, who just la left, Bill O'Reilly. These people strike me as people who are, represent a, an era when actually these, this kind of thing was more the norm and that was okay. And every, every, that, was, that was what the, the institution looked the other way. And now that we have rules that, you know, now that people have become aware that this is an issue, we're sort of finding our way through it. <coughs> And, you know, it, it, it may not be perfect, but it seems strange to me that to focus entirely on the cases that you did when there are so many other examples of, of quite legitimate gripes. But see, okay, so it, you are a scientist, I think you said. Um, you have just rolled together a lot of very disparate kinds of cases uh, where what I'm saying is you have to take them one by one and not make assumptions based on one case and assume that you know the same thing can be said about the other case. So Roger Ailes, if I understand it, engaged in what would be called quid pro quo harassment. It was like sleep with me you know, and I'll promote you or get you a better gig or won't fire you or whatever. My understanding about the Marcy case, because I did look at that material, is that Marcy touched people like on their shoulders in ways that they didn't like. Because I think there's a rising sense of sensitivity among women about being touched. And I don't like it when somebody I don't, that I'm creeped out by puts his hand on my shoulder either. But my impression was that he did not sexually harass people. He touched people. He was like a hugger or a toucher in ways that made people uncomfortable. I may, you may know more about it than I do. But those are just radically different kinds of charges. And in a different atmosphere, maybe Marcy could have been uh, consoled, you know, to keep your hands off women. They don't like it. But it wasn't quid pro quo harassment, as far as I understand it, OK? So that's partly what I'm talking You know, there's a slippery slope kind of thinking. So like, because Ailes did it, then Marcy should have been fired. You know, so, OK? That wasn't my point. I okay. was just trying to yeah. raise a number of different okay. examples. OK, but that's why you, you know, Cases where, but that's why the, the no face of it, it looked like the people who were, you know, uh, who were experienced. And then there's one case that we all know of where they got okay. away with it, which is our president of the United States. Right. OK. But um, <laughs> again, I mean, because Trump got away with it doesn't mean Marcy should have been fired. So, so on, that's one part of what is difficult. I don't, I don't OK, could I just talk? Could I talk? Part of what's difficult about this subject is this. You know, the assumptions that people want to make, and we're well-meaning, and we want to say the right thing. As far as the statistics, um, one of the issues is that there's no common agreement among the main uh, surveys about sexual assault about what sexual assault even means. So, and I have talked to a statistician and you know, quote a statistician uh, who works with these numbers who say, like for example, there's no nationally representative accurate uh, numbers exactly for the reason that you know, if you look into the methodologies of the statistics, in those major surveys, 
the, uh, you know, you can't extrapolate from two Midwestern colleges, you know, with a voluntary reporting method to a nationally representative number, for example. So that's what I mean about the statistics not being reliable, that there are a lot of assumptions made when somebody hears a number that that number is nationally representative, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a scientist or a statistician, you probably understand what, what I mean. But also this extrapolating from one case to another because Trump did it then, you know, X. That's what, I mean, I'm, I feel like I don't have the skill set or like the, um, I don't know, aptitude to be able to like put a halt to what I'm calling the slippery slope thinking. But somebody has got, or more people have to step up and protest uh, that, look, we're, this is a rush to judgment. And I think Marcy, from what I understand about the Marcy case, I think he got hung out to dry. So, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, Paglia, um, I just recently read that essay in the, because it's in the new collection, which I hadn't read it before. And yeah, she is saying very similar things in the 90s. So, I mean, this has been going on for quite some time. Uh, I think it's now institutionalized in a different way because, you know, of Title IX and the institutions taking it on uh, in, a, in a more pervasive way. I mean, Paglia is not somebody I'm deeply fond of, <laughs> you know, as a writer. I mean, she, she's just all assertion. There's no argument. There's no evidence. It's kind of all style. and. Um, I don't think she's wrong about the stuff with on sexual assault. I just don't think it's a very well-made argument. So um, uh, there was something else I wanted to say, which I've not forgotten about. You know, bureaucracies. Um, I'm not a sociologist, and I don't know a lot about the sociology of bureaucracy, but I think what you see is mission creep you know, in these cases, that once a, an entity is empowered to adjudicate an area, they grow that area, you know? And so, and they take on more and more stuff. So, I mean, I think that you were maybe kind of talking about a, a similar sort of thing, and it's the thing to be aware of, because it's the, uh, I think it is what's happened in the US. The more power that these entities get, and the more funding, the bigger they want to get. You know, there's like no limit. Uh. Well, Laura, thank you very much. Before um, I, I, I formally thank you, uh, just a, a couple of words um, in conclusion. And, and I, I think this argument about uh, the slippery slope is an important one. And uh, I think it, it does, in a way, explain in a, in a very economical way um, the reason why we want to have this discussion is because we, we do witness similar kinds of tendencies in this country. And I think that the last point there was, was very well taken in that respect, that we, we have to be quite um, vigilant about what's going on. Um, on Canadian campuses, even if your own well. institution is a panacea, yeah, well, it sounds like a we, wonderland. We, I, I, of I don't, I, I don't know that we would go that far. <laughs> but maybe we've gotten some some of the things uh, right. Um, I think also this idea of administrative creep is is really important because um, we don't just live in the university. We live in a society in which there's executive creep in a big way, um, because your executive is a creep. Um, but it's in the United States. But it's it's also happening here in Canada, yeah. right? We had it under the previous government. Um, There's a very draconian uh, anti-terror legislation that was put into place. Um, and this government had uh, the, the the new current Trudeau government had pledged to um, to uh, amend the legislation, and it hasn't done that. So the, the powers are amassing, and so I think this discussion has to be situated with in the larger context. Not that you should do it, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of. The idea of executive creep is, is a very serious one. Um, we take this very seriously. I don't think we are at all depoliticizing in uh, one bit, actually. And so we have an ongoing uh, series uh, on, uh, it's called the, the Spectre of Fascism, in fact. And it's happening every Thursday at Unit Pick Gallery. And I hope people come out. There's going to be a great talk tomorrow by Patricia uh, Barkaskas um, on co colonialism and the relationship um, um, with uh, with fascism. So, so those are just some some concluding remarks. I wanted to thank now Laura for a wonderful talk. It was it was a, 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 a great talk. Um, and you prepared to stick around a little bit. Um, as I said earlier.
thank, thank you for all the really interesting questions. I mean, you've really given me a lot to think about, yeah. and I really appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, that was going to be my next uh, thank you. As I always do, um, I'd just like to thank all of uh, uh, the uh, participants tonight who came and asked terrific questions and made great comments. Oh, I thought the yeah. level of discussion was particularly high. It's one thing I'm very proud of, and the steering committee of the Institute is very proud of, is that um, our, our events feature a really good uh, discussion period. Um, reasoned, measured, critical, and I think everything one would uh, hope for uh, in, a, in a university discussion. So thank you all for coming. That's great. <laughs> Books are located outside. Please pick them up as you head out. And Laura's offered to sign them. Oh, yes, so. for sure.